Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus and hungry for a word from the Lord. Now, we're continuing our study in the Red Letter series, and today we're going to pick up in chapter 19, beginning at verse 16. Now, I have skipped past verses 13, 14, and 15, and the reason for doing this is we address this topic of children in the kingdom of heaven, how we must become like children in order to enter into the kingdom. And that was addressed in a red letter series video on Matthew chapter 18, verses one through six. Now, as we approach this topic this morning, let me say right up front that this is a very uncomfortable passage and a very unpopular passage for many who live in Western culture, specifically America, but even in the European countries and other prosperity-filled countries. And the reason for that here in America, for instance, would be that we have the American dream, that you can obtain and live your life any way that you want to. You can make all your dreams come true if only you will work hard. But there's one other condition to that. The other condition is that you, if you hoard much unto yourself, because if you want more, it only makes sense you have to hoard more. I mean, if you give a majority of the things that you have, including your money, away, then you're never going to be considered rich. And it's interesting that this is such an unpopular message because for Jesus, it was the most popular message. Jesus preached against money and material possessions more than any other topic in his ministry. And so as we approach this passage today, we're going to see a conversation that Jesus had with a rich young man, or better known in Bible terms, the rich young ruler. So let's just pick up in chapter 19, and let's begin together at verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what things shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now remember, Jesus has just told the disciples, you must become like little children to have eternal life. And so this man, apparently hearing this message, asked the question, well, what thing must I do? I'm a rich man. Certainly, I don't have to lower myself to the status of a child. So what must I do in order to enter into eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why do you call me good? There is no one good but one. That is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, that's an interesting statement from a Christian mentality. From those who would believe that Jesus was a Christian, why would he say follow the commandments? We don't follow the commandments anymore. But you have to remember that Jesus was a Jew. There was no such thing as Christianity. And so the heart of faith toward God of faithful obedience unto God was following the commandments of God that were handed down by God through angels to Moses. And so Jesus says, follow the commandments. Now listen to what this young man says, because there's no point in my life, no matter how young I was, there's no point that I can recall in my life that I can make the statement that this young man made. The young man said unto him in verse 20, all of these things have I kept from my youth up. What do I lack? In other words, he's saying, I haven't broken one of these commandments. Now look at the commandments that Jesus mentions. Jesus says, thou shalt not murder. That's number six among the 10 commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's number seven. Thou shalt not steal. That's number eight. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That's number nine. Honor thy father and thy mother, that's number five, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, which was a commandment of God, but not listed within the 10 commandments, but wraps up the entire last four commandments in one statement. Love thy neighbor as thyself. 
if you love your neighbor as yourself, you won't steal from him. You won't commit adultery with his wife. You won't kill him. You won't bear false witness against him, and you won't covet the things that he owns, which is commandments 6 through 10. And yet the young man says unto him, again in verse 20, all of these things have I kept from my youth up. And Jesus said unto him, knowing his heart and not calling him on a false statement, it almost seems as if Jesus agrees with him that he hasn't broken any of these commandments. Jesus says, if you will be perfect, if you will be complete, if you will be fit for the kingdom of God, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. And at that point, come and follow me. Forsake everything that you hold dear. Forsake everything that you love. Forsake everything that you cherish. Forsake everything that you have worked so hard for. Deny yourself all these things and come and follow me. And sadly, this young man in verse 22, when he heard what Jesus had to say, he went away sorrowful, grieving. At that moment, he made a choice between the kingdom or the pleasures of this earth. And he chose the pleasures of this earth. That's why he was grieved in his heart. Because he knew he had denied himself the kingdom of heaven by the choice that he had made. And so he went away very sorrowful, grieving, for he had great possessions. Now, if you'll recall in the book of James, chapter 5, James, Jesus' half-brother, who was very aware of the teachings of Jesus, says unto us, Go to now, ye rich man, weep and howl for your miseries that will come upon you. Why? Because you've traded the pleasures of this world for the eternal joy that heaven offers. That's what he says in verse 5. He says, you've lived in pleasure on the earth, and you've been wanton, which means you've led a life of indulgence. You've nourished your hearts. You've lived to your own desires as in a day of slaughter. And that's what's happening here in this story with this rich young man. He had great possessions, and he could not do what Jesus had commanded of him. Now, before we move on, I think it's important to stop here and ask ourselves a serious question because you may consider yourself a poor person and based upon the income of a lot of people in America, you may be, but two thirds of the world tonight of the population of the earth do not know where their next meal is coming from. They do not have a roof over their head. They certainly have no money in the bank or many of the pleasures that you have around you each and every day, that I have around me each and every day. And so compared to two-thirds of the world, friends, you and I are rich. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have any money in the bank. I don't have any savings set away for a rainy day. I have very few possessions. I don't own a home. I don't own lands. I don't own anything of material value. And yet, compared to two-thirds of the world, I'm a rich man. And that causes me to pause when I read passages like this because I can't be so quick to point the finger at others. I have to look at my own life and ask myself, even as few possessions as I do have, do they have a hold on me? Would I grieve if I were to lose them? Because if I were to grieve, if I were to lose them, then they have a hold upon me. And the underlying message that Jesus is teaching us here is that we are to allow nothing to have that kind of a hold upon us. All of our allegiance is unto the Lord Jesus. And if we truly love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and if we truly love our neighbor as ourselves, we would never consider hoarding anything unto ourselves. And we would see to it that those around us have clothes on their back, shoes on their feet, food in their bellies. And yet here we are ap approaching a time of the year in America where billions of dollars, maybe trillions of dollars worldwide are going to be spent on self-indulgence, what are called Christmas presents. And just think, if everyone took the money that they were going to spend on these 
Christmas presents and sent to people who needed it most, what effect would that have upon the world that we live in? But we, like the people whom James is writing to in chapter 5, verse 5, we are living in pleasure on the earth, indulging ourselves with everything that we want, and shame on us for doing it. And we as the rich man in this story should walk away grieving and sorrowful from what we hear, because we are choosing the pleasures of this world over eternal joy that the kingdom offers us. Well, Jesus continues this thought in verse 23, so he looks to his disciples now, no longer addressing this rich young ruler, but he looks unto his disciples and he says, Verily, I say unto you, a rich man will hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because of his possessions. Because of the way that his heart clings to his possessions and his money. And Jesus makes that famous quote in verse 24, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, now when his disciples heard this, they were exceedingly amazed. They were confused, saying to themselves, well, who can be saved then? Because if we compare ourselves to the beggar on the street, all of us are rich. And Jesus said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, Jesus, I believe, is not necessarily saying here that God can make it possible for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying is that God can change the heart of a rich man so that he no longer hoards things unto himself, but he looks for opportunities to help others. And he does so with right motives, not trying to buy his way into heaven, to earn his way into heaven, by the good deeds that he's doing, but by following the impulse in his heart, now that God has changed his heart, and showing favor to others because God has shown favor to him. Well, now Peter, as Peter is so custom to do, in verse 27, says unto Jesus, well, Lord, we've forsaken all, and we followed thee, and what shall we have therefore? And Jesus looked upon the disciples, and he said, I say unto you, those of you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But it's not just you that I'm going to favor, says Jesus, because you are among the first, but the last will be blessed even greater. For everyone who has forsaken houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit eternal life. Well, now let's pause again and make this personal. Jesus says, everyone who has forsaken houses will receive a hundredfold. What if you forsake your video games? What reward lies for you? What if you forsake your sports? What reward lies for you? What if you forsake your makeup or your jewelry? What reward lies for you? What if you forsake your choice in music, your choice in television, your choice in movies, your choices in fashion? What lies for you based upon the sacrifices that you make for the kingdom? Well, Jesus says it is a hundredfold. And he also told us that we are to be laying up our treasure in heaven. Meaning the more you sacrifice here, the greater your reward there. So will you be like the rich young ruler who is more focused on the pleasures of this world or will your focus be upon the kingdom to come? That's a question, friends, only you can answer by the choices you make, by the sacrifices that you make. Well, as I stated when we began this study, I know this isn't a popular message, but it's the truth, friends, and it's so much truth that as I stated also, Jesus preached on it and taught on it more than any other subject. And so as the Bible tells us, and as Jesus said unto his listeners, let him who has ears to hear, hear and obey. And let him who has eyes to see, see and practice what is being shown unto him. Well, I love you, friends. And I truly, 
truly love the Word of God. And it is such a blessing to be able to sit with you again and explain to you the precious words of Jesus and the Holy Scriptures. And I pray that they are having an impact in your life, that they are changing you eternally so that you are being fit and made ready for the kingdom that has been prepared for you and that lies not too far in the distance in just the days ahead. Now, as the Lord Jesus wills, and until next time, friends, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.